While the world constantly points us to measure success by material possessions, we who are Catholic are called to a different path. We are called to speak the truth, even when the world loves lies. We are called to follow Christ, even when the world will mock us for it. In this first chapter, we are going to look at how to form our youthhood centered on Christ. Youthhood is the time of our life which is filled with all kinds of possibilities, yet there are many challenges as well. You have probably heard the phrase, be in the world, but not of the world, uttered as if it is some sort of programmed response for the definition of discipleship. While you may nod your head expressing complete agreement and say to yourselves, of course we should live in this world, but not be of it. Moments later, the ambiguity of that statement begins to sink in. And you begin to ask yourself questions like, what does it even mean to be in the world, but not of it? Or can this abstract concept apply to my life? in a concrete way. These are just a couple of the questions that begin to swirl around in your mind. We are a people of routine. Our minds are programmed to identify and establish patterns. We find what works and we stick to it. And our faith life is no different. Oftentimes, when trying to live our faith in an increasingly secular and sensitive world, we find our safe spaces. These are the places where we feel comfortable being unabashedly Christian. The places where we openly share our belief in Christ with others. Think of our youth group and the Holy Corbono that we attend weekly. Our church community is the most common safe space that we have. And while this community is of great importance because it helps us to grow in our faith and the pursuit of heaven, we should not limit ourselves. We need to branch out and find God in all things. Think about all the places you go to on a regular basis. Your school, work, the gym, grocery stores, shopping malls, or even your favorite restaurants. Now think about all the people you interact with. Classmates, co-workers, cashiers, other random strangers. The reality is that you spend most of your time outside of the church community, interacting with people who may or may not belong to the same religion. So how do you, a faithful disciple of Christ, Share your faith in these places with these people. It is during the time of your youthhood where you begin to acquire the ideals and the values which shape and influence your outlook on life. It is also a time where you gain more independence and become less reliant on your elders. While one of the characteristics of youthhood is freedom, we are seeing a generation that abuses freedom growing up. And freedom is being misinterpreted as the sanction to do anything. In other words, if it feels good, do it. Youth who are going after their own likes and interests and subscribe to this way of life are traveling down the path of selfishness. The decline of values has greatly contributed to the decreased value of moral and eternal truths. And this can be seen in our socio, political, and cultural levels. During this time of youthhood, the youth are also facing many challenges, such as the pressures of alcohol and drug use, bullying, an increasing pressure of secularism, and extreme liberal ideology. The culture of consumerism has commercialized human life itself. 
They bury the ideals for the sake of money and popularity and sacrifice interests of the community. It is against this social backdrop that our youth are facing immense pressures, the likes of which previous generations never had to experience. One example of this is social media trends. Young people grow in their Catholic faith by falling in love with the person and message of Jesus Christ and mature in faith when they let that love form and transform them within the church, a community of disciples. If one wishes to know and follow Jesus, one must have a correct understanding of who Jesus is. On the next slide, we will see a short video by Bishop Robert Barron studying the question, Who do you say that I am? Jesus didn't ask, what do people think of my teaching? Or what impression am I making? Reasonable enough questions. He asked, who do people say that I am? It'd be hard to imagine another great religious founder asking such a question. The Buddha wouldn't focus on himself, and I say it to his credit. He would say, there's a way I've discovered, I want you to know it. Mohammed wouldn't focus on himself, he'd say, there's a revelation I've received, I want you to know it. Confucius wouldn't say it's about me, he'd say it's about this path that I found. Then there's Jesus. His question is, who do you say that I am? The whole gospel really hinges on this point. Jesus' identity personally is what it's about because throughout the Gospels, he consistently speaks and acts in the very person of God. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, unless you love me more than your very life, more than your mother and father, you're not worthy of me. You might imagine a religious teacher saying, unless you love God more than your very life. But to say, unless you love me more than the highest goods in the world? Jesus says to the paralyzed man, my son, your sins are forgiven. Right away, the bystanders say, who does this man think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Now here's the point. Jesus compels a choice the way no other religious founder does. Either you're with me, he said, or you're against me. Do you see why? If he is who he says he is, then we have to give our whole life to him. If he is God, then he must be the center of our lives. If he's not who he says he is, he's not a good man. He's a dangerous, misguided fanatic. Jesus, more than any other figure, more than any other religious founder, compels us to make a choice. There's a strange passage in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel that's rarely commented upon. Jesus and his disciples are making their way from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. Mark says this, And they were going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. This obscure fragment is, I think, very telling. One might be intrigued by a religious teacher. One might be captivated by a spiritual leader, but amazed and afraid. Then we recall that in the Old Testament, awe and fear are two standard responses to God. Having grasped this uniqueness of Jesus, we can begin to look at his preaching and action with greater understanding. He was God in the flesh, Yahweh moving among his people. Jesus is strange. You know, I, I, I'm going to resist the tendency to domesticate him and turn him into, yeah, he's like, you know, an ancient uh, Deepak Chopra, you know, who had interesting spiritual insights. And the gospel writers told these kind of cool stories to exemplify that. I think he was strange. 
And so people say that they were amazed and afraid. I don't think anyone's really amazed and afraid of Deepak Chopra. They might find him insightful and helpful, but I doubt they're amazed and afraid. But when someone takes uh, five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000, that's a little scary. And I think if, if, we, if we domesticate Jesus too much, we take away that dimension from him. They were intensely interested in the fact that Jesus drove out demons, that he performed miracles, that he healed people. Even like the calming of the storm at sea, you know, when that's over, they say, who, who is this? Who is this man who can calm the... I mean, they knew all about spiritual gurus. They all had rabbis and teachers and insightful people. But he was so far beyond that. Who, who is this who's calming the, the sea? The fundamental question in the Bible, who is Jesus, and St. Peter's answers to it, is very relevant. Jesus once asked, who do you say that I am? We can return the question and ask, who do you say you are? In the Gospels, Jesus identified himself as Son of God, Messiah, and Savior. In fact, in the scriptures, Jesus referred to God as his Father who sent him, John chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. He also says in Matthew 11:27. The Father loves his Son and shows him everything that he himself does. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also does the Son give life to whomever he wishes. At the Last Supper, Jesus explained, The world must know that I love the Father and that I do just as the Father has commanded me. John 14, verse 31. Jesus declared himself to be Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, verse 8. Three times in chapter 8 of the Gospel of John, Jesus called himself, I am, a phrase that recalled God's name. Jesus also stated his purpose on earth. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus also revealed who he was through the figures of speech. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light of life. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And lastly, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Peter's response to the question, Who do you say I am? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, is the first authentic statement about the personality of Jesus. The incarnation of Jesus was an event that transformed the world into the history of salvation. The perfection of humanity was given to the world in Jesus through the incarnation. Although being God, wearing the robe of humanity, Jesus gave a new dimension to the God-man relationship. It is in Jesus that we are able to discover a consciousness of original existence and possibilities of life to the human life. When the divine and human natures were united in Jesus, that became the dogma of divine human relationship and revelation. The branch of study, Christology, or the study of Christ, is included in the catechetical studies based on this truth, which is considered with the greatest importance 
among the Christian doctrines. The subject of the discussion in Christology is the knowledge about the personality of Jesus. In the words of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, God walked our path as man. He entered into human history to give us his very life. And he did this not with splendor of a sovereign subjugating the world with his power, but with the humility of the child. The unity of God-man, the salvific event, has rewritten the history of the world. We see this in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. This is the fundamental view of Christianity. Jesus is not beyond history. On the other hand, he is the person who transformed the very history of the world into salvation history. The divine power that is revealed through Christ is considered to be the salvific event. The term soteriology indicates the salvific power and transformation that are given to the world through the person of Jesus. The deliverance which the world received through Jesus ought to be understood by us in connection with the Christ event known as the Paschal Mystery. Salvation history becomes complete through the events of the Passion, Death and Resurrection of Jesus. It becomes salvific because Jesus, through sacrificing his own life, has achieved our salvation. The uniqueness of salvation history of Jesus is that he, on the altar of endurance, offered himself until death and achieved the new life through his resurrection. The Paschal Mysteries is celebrated and made present in the liturgy of the Church and its saving effects are communicated through the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, which renews the Paschal sacrifice of Christ as the sacrifice offered by the Church. The question, why did God become man in Jesus, is answered in the Nicene Creed. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. The purpose of the Incarnation was to effect the salvation of all mankind. St. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. 
In the Gospel of John we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We know from Revelation, especially from Genesis and the infallible teachings of the Church, that in the beginning, God created man in a state of innocence and friendship with himself. As a result of man's rejection of God's love, he lost this original innocence and came under the power of sin and the devil and was subject to death. Having lost God's grace, which was a pure gift to begin with and something to which he had no just claim, man became an outcast, unable to achieve the noble destiny to which God had ordained him. Since man could not save himself from sin and could not by his own efforts regain the grace of God, God in his own infinite wisdom resolved to become man. Thus Jesus was able to make satisfaction to God's justice, for all his actions had an infinite worth. Therefore the creed proclaims that the reason for the word becoming flesh was to accomplish the salvation of men. And when the creed says men, it means all people without any distinction as to race, color, or creed. The fathers of the church have explained this divine truth as the authoritative truth. St. Ephraim the Syrian father has said, He gave us divinity, we gave him humanity. St. Augustine wrote, God became man, hence man should become God. In other words, God became man in order to make man divine. The man who walks in Christ experiences God's salvation in life. Man will be led towards eternal life if only he experiences in life the power of salvation. The personality and salvific power revealed in Jesus has always intrigued the young people. The activities and the viewpoints of Jesus can immensely influence the life of youth. The world has obtained a new human view in Jesus and Jesus taught the world the gospel of love and the newness of morality. Above all, Jesus instructed that the perfection of youthhood is in seeking and finding out God. It is important for us to note that everyone is created in God's image and likeness. Jesus taught that all men being created by God are all the children of God. All discriminations, differences of big or small, sex or caste, are not impediments to see men as men. Jesus raised the value of men above discriminations of caste and class or socio-economic conditions. He installed the human virtues of brotherhood and service which is directly opposed to the mentality of domination and intoxicated authority. The love Jesus speaks of and what he has taught is that of an unselfish love. The proclamation about the kingdom of God is fulfilled in his life as we read in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The gist of the proclamation of the kingdom of God is the view of man itself. The gospel of the kingdom of God is given to man through Jesus. That is why it is said the institution of the kingdom of God started in Jesus. The inception of the kingdom of God reveals in its full meaning through his passion, death, and resurrection. The divine plan about man is being fulfilled through the Paschal Mysteries. 
The message of love manifested through the words and life of Jesus is another element which attracts young people towards Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 to 45 we read, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Through this advice, Jesus gave a new meaning to unselfish love. And what is reflected in all the works of Jesus is the vision of love. Divine love has flowed into mankind through Jesus. Jesus is the perfect existence of divine love, the Word incarnate. It is through the incarnation of Jesus that the love of God, the Father towards mankind, is revealed. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. John 3:16. The aspect that is included in Jesus is love. The reason for this is because God is love itself. The will to forgive is the fertile ground for love. We read in Matthew chapter 5 verse 23 and 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. The offering of sacrifice is meaningless where there is no love. What is manifested in the sacrifice is the sharing of love. Love is more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Mark chapter 12, verse 33. The ultimate sign of God's love for man is seen through the death and resurrection of Jesus. What we see on the cross is the perfect dedication on account of the love of man. What Jesus undertook are the wounds of man for the sake of love. What is being offered in the church through the Holy Corbono is the commemoration of the suffering sacrifice on the cross. When Jesus gives his body and his blood to us in the form of bread and wine, it is the love of God for man that is revealed. When love is immersed in sacrifice, the offering of sacrifice is changed into the offering of love. It is through Jesus that the youth understand that they are sharers in God's image and the life is meaningful. In short, the perfection of human existence is seen in Jesus. The Christian life is a journey and Jesus reminds us that he is the way, the truth and the life. John chapter 14 verse 6. When Jesus says this, he means the truth and the perfection of life which men ought to find in Jesus. As youth, we should accept Jesus and travel along the path in life and view him as a friend and guide. In order to give shape to the vision of life of the youth, we should make the views and life of Jesus as our model. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 17 to 22, we encounter the rich young man. Am I good enough for God? That was the question this young man asked Jesus. By all accounts, the young man was a faithful Jew who followed the law, but his efforts did not seem enough. He wanted, if not certainty, at least a sense of assurance that he was headed for the kingdom of God. Jesus answered the question with a call to discipleship. In essence, he told the young man, give up all other attachments to life and make me your first priority. The young man could not do this 
And so he walked away from Jesus in great sorrow. The disciples were astounded. For if anyone could claim divine favor, the rich young man who followed the law and was universally admired, they could not believe that he would have the hardest time entering the kingdom. The followers must have thought to themselves, God bless this righteous man with success. If he and those like him cannot be saved, who can? Here Jesus answered the question, Who is good enough for God? His answer was no one. And that was his point. People could not please God by themselves. Only God could save, and he wanted to save them all, saint and sinner alike. For nothing is impossible for God. For youth who seek the meaning of life, they should find the same in Jesus. They should be able to find out the perfection of humanity in Jesus. To seek refuge in the perfection of Jesus in order to acquire in life a new sense of direction and aim. In the 2010 Hyde Park Address, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI states, Dear young friends, Jesus alone knows the plan about you. Be open to listen to the words Jesus speaks to the innermost chamber of your hearts. His heart speaks to your hearts, now and always. In short, young people who find out the meaning of life in Jesus and the path towards eternal life realize the saying, youthhood is rooted in Christ. Jesus is the most suitable person for all periods. There has never been another person in the history of the world who has influenced human community and the lives of individuals like Jesus. The youth will be able to discover in Jesus a new era. Seeing God as Father, the young people should be witness to Jesus, having dedicated their life to Him. Youthhood rooted in Christ is not a lifeless ideal. Youthhood should become a state of life which fulfills the gospel having placed Jesus as part of life in the areas of action in life. The gospel that God gave us is Jesus himself. Youthhood will change as rooted in Christ when the lifestyle and the ideals of youth change as witnesses. <laughs>